Anime Summer Season 2022. We actually have to do things a little bit different this season, because normally, traditionally, when I do these videos, I like to pick a small handful of shows that I think are probably going to be very worth watching. We talk about it a bit, and I leave you with that recommendation. Normally, when I do this, however, I like to avoid, or at least sidestep, talking about sequels and things, because generally, my mindset has always been, if you like the original series, you're probably going to like the sequel, and you should move on from there. This season, however, most of the exciting things our sequels. I don't have a lot to actually hype up the unknown shows at the moment. We'll have to wait a couple of weeks until that actually builds up a bit and maybe some of them will be worth talking about. But as I sit here right now, the sequels are kind of the only good thing. So what we're going to do today is we're going to be talking about five different shows, some of which I think are going to be really good slash are already really good because we already have a few episodes out. But we're also going to spend a little bit of time trying to steer you away from some things because other shows this season <laughs> T-Pose off the building! And so today we're gonna be looking at a variety of different shows that are coming out this season with the hope that something will be worthwhile. I may be biased considering one of the shows we're talking about today is <clears throat> one of my favorites of all time, but I'm not biased, no. Thing is though about watching a bunch of different shows on a variety of different streaming services is that depending on where you live, you might not be able to access them without today's sponsor. Glass Reflection would like to thank the sponsor for today's video being the good people over at Surfshark VPN. A VPN for those who still, somehow, lived under a rock and don't actually know, is a way to help you protect your privacy and what you view online as you surf and watch anime and videos on the web. Not only does it secure your data, encrypting it to help stop people from eavesdropping on your connection, but it also allows you to mask your location, which is very important for our purposes, as doing so will allow you to bypass the region locking of a variety of streaming services, as not all streaming services are equal in what regions they service. Especially now, since they're all combining and splitting off and giving each other playful little middle fingers and everything. It sucks for us though. So having a VPN like Surfshark can help you access the shows that you might not be able to otherwise. Content blocked on services such as Netflix and YouTube can be easily accessible simply by connecting to a local server from the country that you'd like to access. Surfshark is available on a variety of different devices as well as your PC, so you can stream your anime on the go if you so choose. There'll be a link and a promo code in the description where you can sign up for a percentage off as well as an extra three months free, because we like you so much. And best of all, if you try it out, you find it doesn't help, it's not doing what you expected, or it doesn't end up unlocking the content that you wanted to, then Surfshark offers a 30 day money back guarantee, no questions asked. So thank you very much to Surfshark for sponsoring. Let's talk about this season, shall we? So the first show that we want to talk about today is Devil is a Part-Timer Season 2. Something I never expected to say in front of this camera, honestly. Because it has been nine years. And honestly, I expected this series to be dead. I wouldn't be surprised if most anime fans of today were even watching anime back nine years ago. If you look up the normal age demographic of anime fans, a lot of people would probably be in diapers back when the first season came out. But I'm old. So nine years ago, we had Devil is a Part-Timer Season 1, which can be modernly described as a reverse isekai, where Satan and his demon generals have been forced to leave their previous fantasy realm and end up in modern-day Japan. Instead of trying to take it over in the traditional sense, they tried to integrate within the new modern Japanese society, which involves our protagonist, Satan, becoming a cashier at McDonald's. Oh, I'm sorry, McRonald's. You gotta be careful with the copyright there. And so this is not a fantasy action series in the traditional sense, it is more of a fantasy comedy series. With these characters who used to come from some kind of like elegant life of the, the great and powerful are now living as near hobos in a very somewhat decrepit one room apartment with barely any money for food and supplies. Season two picks up where we left off 
from season one nine years ago, which is both good and bad. Good because what we left was great and actually continuing that instead of like retreading or redoing it, especially for people who are fans of the original, is good. It's bad because if you didn't watch the original, you're behind. Now, some might not look at that as a bad thing. And in, in my case, I would say that that's potentially a good thing because it could convince you to go and watch the original season, which was very, very good. But also I am slightly wary because we have had things in the past where, you know, that big of a gap with leaving people in the lurch can sort of be a bad thing. I am mostly looking at Log Horizon for this particular venture because the most recent season of Log Horizon, well, I didn't watch it. And I don't know many people who are really big into Log Horizon who did watch it because it has been such a big gap that really I needed to rewatch the original two seasons of Log Horizon to remember how things went. But in fairness, Log Horizon was far more of a politically motivated series as far as interpolitics between the characters and relationships. It was very big and very detailed and you needed to remember all of these things, which were very hard to do when it had been years since you witnessed the material. Devil is a part-timer though doesn't have things that are overly complicated by comparison. You can pick up most of the, the relationships between characters just by watching them and a handful of scenes. And even if you have to go and watch the original season, it's only a core of episodes which you can watch in an afternoon. It's very very quick to pick up and I highly recommend it. It should be a fun and fancy free reverse isekai comedy that will hopefully, hopefully be one of my favorite shows of the season because the original was one of my favorite shows of that entire year. I'm also kind of hopeful, also kind of not, that Crunchyroll ends up dubbing it. Crunchyroll picked it up this time because the original series belonged to Funimation back when, you know, they were a thing and Funimation dubbed it way back in the day. Dubbing of season two, however, is kind of up in the air. We still don't entirely know. Nothing is for certain as far as what Crunchyroll is going to do with their dubs, if they're going to dub something, how that dub is going to be, and who's going to act in that dub. But personally, if they are going to dub Devil as a part-timer season two, it better be with the original cast. I personally hate it when you have multiple seasons of a show that have different casts. I understand the reasoning behind it from a business sense, but from a personal enjoyment sense, it's very jarring and it's annoying, and I'd almost rather that just didn't. It also doesn't help that the original dub has one of my highlight examples of one of my favorite castings in a dub ever, which was Tia Ballard as Chiho. Because Chiho as a character is almost very sickly sweet, I'd like to say is a good description of her personality. And a lot of times that type of character is not really performed to what you would expect after listening to the Japanese versions when when you when you get to the English section. Chiho from the original season one dub though was absolutely perfect. It's one of like my favorite dub castings ever. And if they don't keep that, I will be <sighs> disappointed. <laughs> Moving on to Lucifer and the Biscuit Hammer. I'm going to say straight up, I know very little about this story. It is completely unknown to me and it was on my watch list as a recommendation from a good friend who absolutely adores the source material. That said, Oh, I am so sorry. I am so sorry that this is an adaptation of a story that you seem to really like. Cause it's not good. Really, it's almost on the borderline of, I'd almost recommend it just so that people can see an example of how not to do things. So Lucifer and the Biscuit Hammer follows a guy who has a lizard that shows up and says, you have a divine purpose now. You are a knight. You need to go and find a princess. You need to protect her and save the world. And of course our protagonist has no interest to in doing any of that and tries to avoid destiny as much as he can. That of course is unavoidable because as these things often are, danger comes to him and he's just gonna have to deal with it. The problem is, as interesting as this story is, and there are some things that are interesting, I can see why people would enjoy the original material because the original material was probably presented in a much better fashion. Uh, in this case, it's presented as if it's a PowerPoint. There's very little animation in this animation. It is very heavily reliant on still shots with some movement, some things that change, hair specifically. And for a series that I would assume is going to eventually contain a decent amount of action to it, to have very little of that in the actual animation, ah, that's not good. It also has a major red flag for me for reusing shots from the series in its OP, which I only knew because I remember watching this one shot of a girl with her hair moving and thinking, oh, that's not as fluid as it could be, only to see them reuse that shot in the opening, which 
Oh my god, the opening is supposed to be like your example of the best that the animation of the show has to offer, or at least fairly close to it. It is something that you can justify throwing more resources on because it's going to be at the start of every episode. You want to lead with a good foot here. Not that reusing shots can always be, it's not like a 100% indicator of a bad time, but it is a red flag. <laughs> T-posing off a building is, you know, another. I will say, to its credit, I did enjoy the saxophone bit in one of the action musical tracks. That was really nice to hear. It doesn't save it. And I'm slightly hopeful that maybe the production will fix things, but... <sighs> As we're probably going to mention with another entry in today's video, the first episode should be your best foot forward. It, it, it should be what grabs people, what gets them interested. If you'd never heard about the series before, this first episode is supposed to get you invested. Does it do that? No. I'm only invested so far as to seeing how far this train wreck will actually go. Which means I'm probably gonna jump off after another episode or so. And instead move to something like Tokyo Mew Mew New. Definitely a uh, personal preference, obviously. I don't expect many people who watch this video to give a care about Tokyo Mew Mew. But I, as a person who has actually sat in front of a lot of people at conventions talking about the history of Magical Girl shows, I do appreciate a celebratory series of, I think, 20 years of Tokyo Mew Mew. Now, of course, said panel that I normally do of the history of Magical Girls doesn't actually cover Tokyo Mew Mew. Because when you have to condense, like, the entire history of a genre that covers, like, multiple decades into, like, an hour, there are some things that are going to be skipped, and Tokyo Mew Mew is one of them. In fairness, it's because Tokyo Mew Mew, the original Tokyo Mew Mew, we'll, we'll talk about the differences or lack thereof momentarily, but Tokyo Mew Mew is kind of like this weird personification of all of the popular things about the genre from its original time period. It came out in the very early 2000s, and it contains a lot of things that were very popular from Magical Girl shows in the 90s, and it contains things that continued to be popular throughout the 2000s. There are a lot of comparisons people make with Sailor Moon, with Park After Sakura, things of that nature, and rightly so. You have five girls who end up getting super magical powers. They're fighting off a threat of aliens who are trying to take over the world, but there are other things that are very unique to Tokyo Mew Mew in that it follows some very specific archetypes, because not only are they cat girls, not only are they magical girls, but they're also waitresses and maid waitresses at that. There's a lot of boxes that are being checked here. Ultimately, the original series is pretty complicated, and I'm I am truncating and glossing over a lot, because I think the original Tokyo Mimi adaptation was like 52 episodes? It is a long one, so there's only so much I can summarize in a couple of minutes. But one of the great things about this new series because it has new in the title, is that you don't need to necessarily have watched the old series. Probably for the better. I rewatched a little bit of it in preparation for this video. It didn't age necessarily well. It's 20 years old. I mean, uh, don't expect that. But this new adaptation is literally a new adaptation. We are rebooting everything from start. So if you know nothing about Tokyo Mew Mew, great! The show should hopefully cover all of their bases there and get you up to speed on who these characters are, what their deal is, and how things are going to move forward. And honestly, I find that very refreshing, which is an interesting thing to say, I think, because, you know, we are technically retreading a story that existed and has existed for over two decades now. How can I find that fresh? Well, I find it fresh because <sighs> Magical Girls as a whole genre had to take, took a very interesting turn about a decade or so now into a much more grim, dark territory than its forebears. And Tokyo Mew Mew was still from that, like, high point of very nice, very happy, very sweet, like, protectors of love and justice and all that sort of thing. That type of magical girl, not the other kind. And so to bring us back to, to that era of the genre, to me, is a breath of fresh air. As someone who's been a fan of the magical girl genre for a very long time, I'm happy to see a lot of essentially old tropes coming back into some semblance of fashion. Like, 
in this first episode alone that has already been released, just watching the transformation sequence, oh my god, I haven't seen an extremely well animated transformation sequence in what feels like a decade. It's probably been more recent than that, I'm just having a bad memory moment right now. And there's just a lot of this series that is just so well put together. It does very much feel like the people involved are either fans of the series or fans of the genre, and there is a level of polish there that goes with it. Now, I'm not saying that it is literally the best Magical Girl series that could have ever come out, but neither was the original series, and that's kind of the thing. The original Tokyo Mew Mew was not a highlight of its era. It probably won't be a highlight now, but I am just enjoying it for what it is. Really? That, that, that's how I describe my enjoyment here. I'm enjoying it for what it is. And some of you may agree with me that that is something to celebrate. Other people probably have already clicked away. Oh well. So let's attempt to bring them back by, uh, I don't know if shitting on is the correct description of what we're about to do. But we're gonna talk about Ruby! Ice Queendom! Because this is one thing we love on this channel, is talking about Ruby again! Alright, so the first episode of Ice Queendom is already out. Now, before watching that, I made a couple of notes of things that I was, like, kind of really hopeful for. Ruby, if you don't remember, either from living under a rock and never seeing anybody talk about it, or not seeing me talk about it from a few years ago when we reviewed the majority of the series I was out at that point. It is a Western 3D animated series by Rooster Teeth down in Texas, but it is a series that follows a lot of very anime-inspired tropes and themes, and if someone is to bring up a list of Western shows that are anime-adjacent or anime-like, Ruby is definitely something that should and does get brought up. This time, however, someone had the bright idea of, hey, Ruby is pretty close to being anime anyway, Anyway, what if, what if we got an actual Japanese production studio to animate a version of it for us? Then it would actually be anime. Wouldn't that be cool? Except not. Okay, so I'm gonna rail on this pretty hard, mostly because I had higher expectations for it than I probably should have. The best way I can describe what I have seen so far in Ruby Ice Queendom is that the original Ruby, as far as quality, was a series of peaks and valleys. The peaks, really high, really good, memorable, but the low points, the valleys, so low. And that was kind of its thing, and Ruby was very entertaining to watch because of that. You'd get things that would blow your mind and you'd think, oh my god, this series is amazing, and then we go crashing back down to reality. That was the original series. How I would describe the new series, Ice Queendom, this anime flattens that curve considerably. Which, in some cases, it's very good, and in others, not so much. Now, episode one that I have watched so far is a re-adaptation of the white and black trailers. <laughs> trailers, we're adapting trailers now, from the original series and also the first handful of episodes of our main cast, going into Beacon Academy. And there is a scene somewhat at the midpoint of this episode now uh, with our main character, Ruby, that pretty, to me, exemplifies the flatness of the quality curve here. In the original series, you had some weird jankiness with a lot of the animation in, in, in characters in the low points of the series where there's not a lot of action. And then when the action actually kicks in, the animation quality skyrockets to almost infinity. It's, it's night and day, the difference between the two. But because of that, this new adaptation gets to that point where in the original things skyrocket and then it just stays the same, which is not bad. It's just not not great. So what disappoints me is not only do we not have the high highs of the show, but I am worried that from a narrative perspective, we're going to be dragging in a lot of the low lows. Because some of the low points of Ruby are definitely narrative driven, and this new adaptation doesn't seem to be breaking new ground as far as the actual story is concerned. We had a bit of a prologue where it explained the world that is pretty similar to what the original series had already shown to us. We saw very similar introductions to the characters, slightly changed here and there. There's a little bit more flair, a little bit more of a segue between scenes that I think works a little bit better. As I said, the low points of the original series are brought back up to kind of a mid-standard. And how it continues from this moving forward will be very interesting to see. However, it's just disappointing because I know 
that they could have done better. So this anime was being produced by Shaft and it doesn't necessarily feel like Shaft has the same level of A game here as they have in other works. When Shaft is on their A game, you know it, right? If you've watched Monogatari, you've seen their A game. If you've watched Madoka Magica, you've seen their A game. If you've watched Sangatsu no Lion, you've seen their A game. If you've watched Fate Extra, You've seen the complete opposite, honestly. And this very much feels like that. I very much get the feeling from this production that it's being done because someone thought it was a good idea, but not everybody is necessarily on board. I feel like it is the difference between having people that are working on a production because they're passionate about it and other people that are working on it because it's a job. That's the feeling I get. I hope I'm wrong and maybe further episodes down the line will change my mind on that. But as we stated before, the first episode is supposed to be, again, your best foot forward. This is what is supposed to grab you. And this doesn't. I'd almost, oh God. I'd almost say that the original Ruby did things better to grab you. Not because overall, as a whole production, the original Ruby was better, but it had enough there. It had those high moments that should have been enough to grab people and did grab a lot of people. And I don't feel like it's here. It doesn't have the lows yet, but it doesn't have the highs. It is just meh. And that's disappointing. What's not disappointing though? Made in Abyss season two. Now, last time we talked about Made in Abyss, I was sitting here in front of a camera talking about the film, the feature film, Dawn of the Deep Soul. Uh, and I was a, a pretty emotional wreck, if I recall correctly. I did say I was going to get around to actually properly discussing that film, and I still want to. I'm just scared of it now, honestly. I have a lot of emotional investment into Made in Abyss, but there are certain things that I feel like I can talk about without getting too emotional about. The first thing, of course, being is just how odd this whole thing is. Made in Abyss season two is, is not in a situation where you can watch season one and be done with it. You have to watch the film, specifically the third film. Oh, that's even worse. So if you've never watched Made in Abyss before, uh, fan recommendation, watch season one, watch movie three, Dawn of the Deep Soul, and then start watching season two. It'll get a little bit confusing because there are two films that come before Dawn of the Deep Soul, but they're just recap films of the original series. And I mean, if you're strapped for time, you could watch those, but also technically, I think if you compare runtime, they're fairly on par with one another. So you could go either way. Personally, because I went through with the original series, that is what I would recommend, but we rarely see this type of thing happen, right? Normally when an anime series gets a film, it is either uh, an end cap on an adaptation because it's like, okay, we're going to wrap it up. We're going to, we're going to have the, the final bit of adaptation is going to be this film and that's how we're going to end it. And then we're never going to touch it again. Once again, another shout out to Madoka Magica for the third time this video. Or if you're going to make a film, it's more like the Shonen films where it's kind of a side story ish sort of thing where the TV anime can continue on without it. It's not necessarily referenced directly. It can be referenced as something that kind of happened, but also if you missed it, you're not gonna miss much. Here, you need to watch <laughs> Dawn of the Deep Soul because they're gonna jump a whole lot. And if you didn't see it, you're gonna be slightly confused. And also Dawn of the Deep Soul is just an amazing film that you really should watch anyway. But we are continuing on from that. And so I am preparing myself for even more I don't even have a word for it. It's not disappointment. I'm not gonna be disappointed in what I'm going to experience. I'm just dreading it with a smile on my face. Oh God. So season two already has one episode out as I am sitting here and we have started off with a whole new cast of characters in a seemingly prologue fashion as this seems to take place far in the past from the continuity of the series and the characters that we are already familiar with. And it is an interesting situation to be in because you have these new characters that are uh, seeking out the abyss that uh, we, we are familiar with from previous entries in the franchise, but these characters know nothing of the abyss. And this is literally, I think, the first time in the franchise where we know more than the characters we're witnessing. And that is very interesting. How that moves forward and how that prologue chapter and those characters tie in 
to uh, the more familiar and modern characters will be fun to see, especially since they weren't the entire focus of the initial episode. We do go back to the characters that we well know and love and are not looking forward to whatever tragic things the story has for them. But seeing more Made in Abyss is always, is always just something that puts a smile on my face. I know I'm probably gonna cry my eyes out at some point in time because that inevitably always happens. Made in Abyss is one of those series that does that to me. I've had it as my, my favorite anime since the first season to come out. Nothing's topped it yet. I keep hoping that something will. I'm, I'm not one of those sticks in the mud that picks my favorite show and, and sticks with it till the end of the earth. In my history of watching anime, I have changed my favorite over time constantly. But Made in Abyss has been a constant, helped along by the fact that every handful of years, we get more of it. And I am very much looking forward to how the rest of this season continues. And in a world where anime adaptations very rarely get sequels, very rarely get continuations, I'm happy that Made in Abyss is continuing to do so. And that's what, that almost feels like a, a very constant with this entire season, because you look at like, well, everything else that I'm recommending from this season, from Devil is a Part-Timer, which hasn't seen a continuation in nine years, Tokyo Mew Mew, which is a 20 year old series, like, a lot of summer 2022 is very much a, hey, let's look at some old favorites. Let's continue on the legacy of some really nice franchises, at least franchises that I am personally a fan of. And that is just so nice. Normally I hate sequels because I, I always do like, I always do like and appreciate new series because if all we got was sequels and retreads, then that would be very disappointing. But I don't mind it every once in a while. And you know, there are a lot of things in this season that I didn't talk about today that could surprise me. That is kind of the thing about new shows that don't have a lot of already existing fan base movement behind it is that the anime could suddenly make them good and popular and shine a spotlight on those series. And I am looking forward to seeing if that is going to happen. But until then, I can at least be thankful in the shows that I already know that I'm going to watch and enjoy. And hopefully I've been able to showcase that to you guys today. So, thank you for watching. I hope I have given you some shows to watch and some shows to avoid in this season. Once again, a very special thank you to our sponsor for the video, Surfshark, who has been sponsoring our videos for quite a reasonably long time, and we thank you for your patronage. Speaking of patronage, a very special thank you as well to the patrons of our channel who make it possible for us to do what we like to do in the fashion that we like to do it. Your wonderful names have been scrolling here. I cannot thank you guys enough. And specifically, I do want to give a thank you to those patrons who help just that little bit more. Those patrons being Rifen Bonaparte, Ross Emerson, Omar Showman, Hector Montemayor, Wago221, and Sidi Yamiko for being especially awesome, and I thank you. Let me know down in the comments if there was anything I didn't cover this season that you think is worthwhile, and if I agree, we might cover it in a future video. And until next time, ladies, gentlemen, and others, watch more anime, and stay frosty.